What's going on today, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Music Production Hot Takes. Boy, we haven't done this in a long time. Oh, wait, we literally uploaded one yesterday. Today, we'll be finishing every other one I didn't respond to. Maybe not every single one. There's a few I was just like, meh, that's redundant, or meh, f that. If you want to take part in the next Hot Takes video, make sure to have your post notifications on on Twitter or Instagram. I'll post in the community post as well, too. So just keep an eye out there. I do it maybe like once every couple months or so. Let's go. Music, kind of mid. True. The sneaky license agreement that comes with free sounds or loops. I have bought at least one plugin that included some sample only to find a license agreement in one of the folders. It's shady at best. I think the word free is being used as clickbait at this point and it, you really have to pay attention to when it's happening. Now, obviously it's not all the time but pretty often if you think about it. For instance when people post type beats in order to get clicks on it they have to put free at the beginning of the title otherwise nobody's going to click on it and then literally it's not even free. It's only free for non-profit. It's only if, it, if you want to use it for profit you have to pay for it. And people only post songs for profit to begin with. It's just a way to get people in the door. It's another trick. At least people aren't clickbaiting free on a hi-hat mini loop. Am I right? I hope not. Trap never gets played out. Y'all just only listen to the radio slash mainstream when there's plenty of diversity within the trap sound. I think trap is no different than other genres in that it sucks. There's definitely certain elements that make trap sound trap. Obviously the hi-hats, the 808 bass. They're pretty much the same in that regard all the time and it's no different than something like reggae having an upbeat guitar or organ sound. I think people just say that because a lot of popular music has been trap for a while now but if you think about it trap is kind of one of the meta genres think about how many hi-hats you can stick into one song with the trap song as well as having some of the heaviest bass pretty much all trap and trap adjacent genres are at the meta in terms of rhythm and uh, bass. That's also easily accessible. While there are other genres that have a lot of hi-hats as well as bass, none of them are really as easily accessible as trap is. Now, am I saying there's nothing else that's better than it? No, I'm just saying that it makes use of those things very well. It sounds good in the club. That's probably why it's on top and it might continue to be on top for a really long time. People love loud bass, what can I say? I'm people. AI won't be nearly as bad for creativity as using loops. AI will probably get rid of loop makers. The bar will be set higher when everyone can make instant custom loops slash samples. Innovation will be what makes you stand out. When everyone can make your style by typing a few words. Like I said before, I think AI will just incentivize creativity. I think people being unique or creative within music will be the new thing to shoot for. Because obviously if AI is gonna take over the way it does, things are just gonna become homogenous if you're doing the same things as them. And so far, it seems like AI just replicates the sound of other music. So I don't think there's too much to worry about if you're actually skilled, but we don't really know yet. Analog actually does sound better and everyone else who insists it doesn't is coping. I mean, I don't know. I've heard quite a few analog comparisons where the analog sound and the emulation are pretty indiscernible. Personally, I feel like what you're paying for with hardware is just having a different way of doing things as well as the prestige. Also, it may make you feel more accomplished than working with software. I have used a bit of hardware in the past when I went to audio engineering college. I've used 1176s. Uh, LA two ways off the top of my head here. That's just my opinion though. Maybe I'm coping. So I would take that with a grain of salt. I would take that with the salt shaker of salt. I would take that with a bullet to the head. Production skills are overrated. Not standing in your way is underrated. I do agree that sometimes production skills are overrated. I think music theory is actually underrated though. And yeah, maybe standing in, not standing in your own way is underrated too. But I really think music theory is underrated. That can get you really far. Some kids I know would smoke any billboard producer head to head. Like I said before, at, at this point, there's so many different producers that if you can't get your stuff in the right hands, then no one's ever going to hear you because there's just way too many people. And I think a lot of billboard producers just happen to know the right people. Even if you're capable of objectively good music, make objectively bad music and defend it at all costs. I agree. We need more of this in this world. If you're making anything else besides EDM, don't sidechain. Just learn leveling tracks correctly. I think it depends what you classify as EDM. I do think sidechain compression and sidechain ducking can be used effectively as a creative tool as well too. What I think of most commonly is like the LA beat scene, especially like 10 plus years ago and i'm sure there's still people doing it at this point it's used often as a rhythm enhancer as opposed to just making things cleaner overdrive your 808's trust this is hot take sir not everything everyone already does takes. Shitty mixing is what makes underground music great, and the more professional you try to make your beats or vocals, the more corporate and less interesting it sounds. Not saying to intentionally distort shit, but don't think too hard on mixing. Now, I definitely would say that this is a topic that requires nuance. Definitely not a binary answer, something that lies on a spectrum for sure. Less than perfect mixing could enhance or ruin a song depending on what you're doing and in what scenario, and it's also definitely subjective. I do think there is something charming about a song sounding slightly amateur. I'll 
also don't enjoy hearing pure shitty mixes as well either. Some examples I could give would maybe be the vocals not being perfectly in tune. Maybe the EQ is not sounding as clean as they could be, not as clean and perfect. But there are definitely some things that just are irritating to an ear. You know, maybe too much resonance that could be that could be irritating. Hyper pop and plug are basically slurs, not real genres. I mean, what defines something as not a real genre? What even defines something as a genre other than the things that make it sound like a genre? And I would say hyper pop definitely sounds a lot different than regular trap music. Whether it's the pitched up vocals, the more distorted mixing, the higher tempo. Plug, I feel like is a very specific sector of trap beats where maybe it could be argued it's too niche in order to be considered an actual subgenre. I do think genres are an effective way for people to figure out what they want to listen to though. I could definitely understand why someone want to separate hyper pop from trap. I think a lot of people that listen to trap and only trap wouldn't want to listen to hyper pop and people that are looking for hyper pop probably are not looking for trap. Start with drums. I wouldn't say always start with drums, but I feel like it's very effective when you are working on a track that has a really strong rhythm or you want to have a really strong rhythm. It can be very effective in making a very strong or very bouncy beat. Ableton is better than FL Studio and it's not even close. FL is a nightmare to look at visually with so many windows slash tabs. I do personally prefer Ableton more. Um, I could see why other people might prefer FL though, like the, especially like the drum sequencer. I do think something that people don't think about enough is that the way a certain DAW or program is set up may work differently or better for people with different uh, types of brains. I do agree that for me personally, FL Studio does have too many tabs and windows. It does feel a bit redundant to me. We should make producer albums more popular. Metro Boomin already did a good job of this, but we could make albums of just instrumentals more popular too. I think they're mostly uncommon in the mainstream rap industry. I find it's actually pretty common in other facets of production, such as electronic music or more underground genres. I do think part of the reason you don't see instrumental albums as much as in the mainstream is just because people generally like vocals more. It's more human. It's something more to connect to. It doesn't make it better or anything, but I just think the average person can connect more to vocals. I don't know if this is necessarily a hot take, but I think that too many smaller producers out there focus on placements when the opportunity is there to distribute their beats on streaming services and they neglect that as a potential income source. Wow, this one's pretty related to the last one. How did that happen? I agree that placement culture sucks. You could focus on your own music more or building with smaller rappers. I think those are both great avenues to consider other than just placements, especially with how saturated it's become with people all trying to get placements. Yeah, you can definitely post your own beat tapes to streaming services as well and make income that way. There's actually no shortage of people trying to listen to instrumental tracks, uh, whether it's people that just want to listen to music in the background, people looking to freestyle to. People should be buying verses from artists and making their own songs more than they should be chasing placements or beat sales. And before gotta sell beats to get money to pay artists. Wow, this one's also somewhat related. Who's putting these in this order? I won't lie, personally, I don't think I'll ever buy a verse from an artist. And it's mostly just because you have to pay the money up front and there's no guarantee that they're not just gonna take a fat sh on your beat. And then you already paid them the money, so you know, you can't really complain about the quality of the verse. They're not gonna fix it most likely. Otherwise, I would actually be more into doing this. SoundCloud isn't dead. So SoundCloud isn't dead, but it's far from what it used to be around like 2014 or so. I would say that was peak SoundCloud at this point. There's just so many better alternatives nowadays, in my opinion. One of the biggest problems I have with SoundCloud is there's no way to consistently let your audience know that you've uploaded a new track without using some sort of external source. But to something such as YouTube, there's a way for people to opt in to getting notified. Uh, you know, the little notification button, speaking of which, consider tapping that on my channels. It also may recommend it to people in their video feed. Spotify has very similar features as well too. The only problem is Spotify generally doesn't pay as much as the fan-powered royalties of SoundCloud. With SoundCloud, you basically just have to hope your followers are on there, see it, and repost it. And reposts at this point are very ineffective. It just seems like a lot more luck. Ableton is a teenage engineering of DAWs. Now, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by this. If you're saying that it's hipster, I could definitely see that, but I do think Bitwig is even more hipster because Bitwig is even more esoteric and very similar to Ableton. Uh, it's definitely more hipster than FL Studio though. I definitely agree to that. But if you're saying it's because it's expensive, I do feel like a lot of DAWs are pretty expensive. Unless you are Sophie, I feel like everyone who brags about never using samples make bad music. I don't know about this one. I do feel like when people brag that they don't use samples in their music though, that's cringe. You're being cringe, bro. I don't think not using samples means you make bad music though. I mean, I guess it depends what genre we're talking about, right? Uh, I would say the entirety of dubstep music doesn't use samples for the most part. Garage music quite often doesn't use samples. I mean, I came in, I'm not even gonna focus on specific artists because entire genres don't use samples. I mean, there's a lot of good music that uses samples and doesn't use samples. I mean, a lot of the beats for really good rappers don't use samples. I almost feel like this take was bait because it's like, 
really? You think that you have to sample in order to make good music? What about the stuff that you're sampling? Do you think that uses samples too? If more producers cared about getting a sound and finding a niche they fuck with, as opposed to doing what's in, there would be so much more variety, competition, passion, and enjoyment in the producer community. Passion? Come on. I do agree that I think uniqueness should be praised more. It's funny because a long time ago, I thought people overvalued that. And at this point with so much saturation uh, with, and type beats as well as AI on the horizon, I think that uniqueness should be praised more because it's going to be something that will take people into the future a lot stronger. No beat making masterclass deserves your money, even if it's a big producer. Going to YouTube and watch every remake slash tutorial slash producer content to learn and practice any technique that you've liked is a better way to use your time. I mean, I'm pretty sure there has to be a masterclass that has some value. I can't really say because I've only watched like a handful of them. I do think there's some reasons that a lot of masterclasses are master ass. <clears throat> I'm sure quite a few producers in that situation are afraid of revealing their sauce and then people copying them and they're no longer unique. So they may withhold a bit of information in order to retain their sound. I guess the thing you're hoping for in a masterclass is they're going to show you all the things that they know that got them to where they are. And then hopefully you'll save some time by watching that instead of having to dig through a bunch of tutorials on YouTube. The problem with YouTube is there's no quality control. Literally anyone can upload there. Now there are a lot of great YouTubers. If you do know great YouTubers to watch that give you valuable information, then yeah, you may save some time going that route. People can upload how-to tutorials and not sound anything like what they're trying to sound like. I'm not going to name any names here because this is a good, clean, fun video but I'm sure there are some names that you can think of. Mainstream artists denouncing the respective music labels for restricting their creative freedoms while having profited tremendously from said music labels is hypocritical, immature, and should be called out more often. I see what you're saying. I do think it depends on the situation though. I think a lot of people who sign to a major label are not quite aware of how deeply they'll be taken advantage of. I do think it's become more common knowledge over the past decade or so though. I think what a lot of people are hoping is that when they sign to a big label, they will have to do less work and things will just be easier for them they can just make music. But it comes with a whole other set of problems when you do that. If you put a guitar amp sim on the master bus, it sounds really good actually. That's not that surprising as a guitar amp is generally distortion. I think people get thrown off by the fact that it says guitar at the front of it. Definitely could be more appropriate for certain genres than other genres though. Fine to actually just practice and not try to sell every single beat you're making. The amount of times I've heard beats placed with smaller artists that have completely out of key 808s just shows me people are trying to skip all the fundamentals and try to be music moguls from day one. There's definitely a level of practice that comes from trying to make something before you make it into a product. Out of key 808s, in my opinion, just proves it's more who you know than what you do. I don't know if you guys saw this recently, but on Kyle Beats most recent, this guy sounds like a little baby video. The 808 in that video is out of key, at least one of the notes is. And it's crazy that someone on that level could do that. I've probably said this like a million times now, but if you guys want to check your 808s really quickly, a great technique to do this is you take the 808s, pitch them up a few octaves, and it should become more obvious which ones are out of key. Fix it however you need to, then pitch it back down a few octaves. Easy fix right there. Baffle metrics, CTZ is still kind of a hot take. From what I understand, this is a technique to clip to zero. Essentially, you put a clipper on all your tracks and you clip it a little bit and you do it in layers and buses and whatnot. And it helps you get a lot more headroom in the long run. And then you end up having to do not too much limiting on the master channel. I'm sure there's quite a few people who've been doing this for a long time and didn't know what had a name. I don't see how it's a hot take, really. I, I feel like this is really effective, especially in electronic music. It can be effective in any genre, though, because clipping can just help you preserve more headroom without too much of a change to sound. Clipping is not super noticeable if you're just doing it a little bit. There are actually indiscernible hardware emulations that exist. No, shut up. Fuck you. It's easier to become Skrillex than installing Camel Crusher in 2023 on a brand new Mac. Yeah, sure, whatever. It's okay to keep the sauce secret, but it's not okay to keep production knowledge secret. Yeah, sure, whatever. It's really funny when someone's trying to keep the sauce secret and it ends up being a really common production technique that someone points out in the comments. That's my favorite type of post. Making new subgenres all the time is hurting the listening experience of people. Genres are a way of class a song as a certain type so listeners who enjoy it can find more of that particular type. This is a really long one. I'm just gonna, that's that's fine there. So genres can be assigned by listeners or creators in my opinion. Actually, that's not even an opinion, that's a fact. Uh, one that comes to mind for me is IDM. I believe IDM was uh, coined by the audience and quite a few of the people that created IDM hated that name. I mean, I don't think genres are as problematic, I hate that word, as people make them out to be. I feel like you can use genres and genre ideas in order to help you make new genres, which can be a new type of sound. Also, hyperpop is definitely not the same as melodic trap. Okay, guys, that's it for this episode of Music Producer Hot Takes. Can't wait to do this again. Just kidding, I hate it. I hate you. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button. For every person who likes this video, I'll give you one hyperpop. So make sure to like the video and you get your hyperpop. Make sure to subscribe if you 
you haven't, uh, check out my second channel, Discord, social medias. If you want to support the channel, become a channel member or join my Patreon. If you made it to the end of the video, comment, music is kind of mid. I'll see you guys next time. Incorporated.